the majority of you, I should say, have asked to be on this show. An overwhelming amount of messages on Twitter, on Facebook, via email, all wanting to hear from the longtime voice of the UFC. 20 years he worked for the UFC, called the biggest fights, the biggest moments. He was there cage side for all of them. The soundtrack of the UFC. We're talking about Mike Goldberg, who was announced shortly before UFC 207 would be parting ways with the company. You've asked for him. We finally got him. Here he is. Joined now on the phone by the one and only Mike Goldberg. Mike, are you there? I am here, my friend. What's going on, bud? It is uh, a pleasure to have you on. Uh, we've been trying hard to talk to you and certainly respect your uh, your space and position to take some time, but I hope you know how many people have been wanting to hear from you, concerned for you, upset about you leaving the UFC. It has been amazing to watch. And so let me ask you this. Let's start with this, Mike. How has the last three-plus weeks been like for you to see this outpouring, this overwhelming amount of support in your favor, the positive messages? What's that like for you? It, it, I, I don't even know if I can put it into words because all I wanted to do during my career, and I said this on my Twitter, was to entertain the fan, to bring energy and enthusiasm to every single show and to represent the fighters. I didn't think for one minute that I would get this kind of love and support from all over the world. I I knew people enjoyed Joe and I on the UFC. I knew people always said, Ariel, that it's different when it's not Goldie and Rogan. But I never really knew until now how much they truly appreciated the job in which I had done for two decades. And the outpour of love and support has been overwhelming. It has been the most humbling experience of my life. And it makes me know deep in my heart that regardless of anything else, that I did it right. And I will continue to do it right wherever that next place might be. But it's all about the viewers. And that's really what it is all about. Of course, we have bosses. We know that. Of course, somebody signs our check. Somebody hires us and fires us. But it's about the audience. It's about the viewers. And I would have never guessed that I would get this much love from around the world, that I would be trending. I don't even know what trending is. (laughs) And I was trending for on UFC 207 fight night. Um, Thank you to every single person who has been so kind in the last month or so. It has been unbelievably rewarding for me. Yeah, very cool to see. I mean, I was getting as many questions about you and, you know, the story surrounding you leaving the UFC as I was about Ronda Rousey. I kid you not. It was amazing. People truly feel a connection to the broadcasters. And in this case, you and Joe, because you have been there for so long and they feel like they know you. They have this connection with you. They sit down and and listen to you speak and tell them about the sport for seven hours almost weekly. And so let's 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 go back to pre-207. When did you find out, Mike, that come 2017 that you would no longer be calling UFC fights? Right around December 1st, I got the news that my contract would not be renewed. And so, you know, I was given about a month's notice and I had a couple of shows left. I had Uriah Faber's last show, which was awesome. I had the trip to Toronto and then of course UFC 207 was my last show. So right around December 1st is when I got the news. Were you completely blindsided by this, or did you have a feeling that they wouldn't re-up your contract? How did you receive the news? Um, it, was, it was a shock. Okay. It was a shock. I, I was speechless. Um, I didn't know what type of emotion to have because I was just in a state of shock and disbelief. You know, people love that warm, fuzzy blanket, and that's what you were describing a second ago, Ariel. And Joe and I have been that warm, fuzzy blanket for a long time when it came to the UFC. Everybody gets new blankets and they get new furniture. But at the end of the day, when you cuddle up on a Sunday and you watch football, that blanket on the corner that's got holes in it and it's kind of smelly, but, but that's your blanket, that's the one you utilize. Everybody has a favorite in their hometown. For me, being from Cincinnati, it's Marty Brenneman. It's this one belongs to the Reds. And, and we don't like change. 
We, we want that warm, fuzzy blanket with the holes because that's our favorite one. The slippers with the holes, the pajamas. We don't like change in our culture, especially when it comes to announce teams. And Joe and I have been so blessed and fortunate to be, and I love the description soundtrack, so blessed and fortunate to be the soundtrack of the UFC for so long, Ariel, that it really was. I was in shock and disbelief for that reason. Because Joe and I have been blessed to be so much a part of the culture for the last two decades. And so you said, okay, you find out December 1st, you still have Sacramento, and you still have 207 left to call. What was that like for you? You know, no, and, and come Sacramento, we don't even know. It comes out a couple of days before 207. Was it tough to focus? Was it tough to prepare, knowing that this amazing run is going to end and very few people even know about it? Internally, what, you, what were you dealing with? You know, characters revealed in times of adversity, and that's what drove me. And the, the most important thing to me as a professional was to continue to do the best I could do on every single broadcast, to, to not alter my studies in any way possible to not alter the timeline of my voiceovers and when they were due in production, to not change anything, you know, to to not have any on-air effect, to go out as a professional, to have the best show possible in Sacramento, in Toronto, and at UFC 207. And, you know, it's interesting that, you know, Joe and I had a lot of fun at UFC 207. We had a lot of laughs and you know, we made the comment afterwards, and, and Joe said that, that was one of our best shows ever. And you're talking about two guys who've done 200-plus UFCs together. And it just reminded me of the chemistry that we're so blessed to have. And it just doesn't happen. It, it doesn't happen in a lot of cases. It, it, it was just chemistry that was there. It was never forced. It, it, we didn't have to build it. We didn't go to a little school and and work on things and and have lunches and dinners and go to chemistry 101 class. We just always had it. So for me, it was going out as a professional. It was continuing to do what my job is to entertain the fans and to represent the fighters and to have great shows. And not only to show my character to the UFC fans, but also to show my character to many people around the world and potentially you know, to my next employer, because as I said, character is certainly revealed during times like this. Mm-hmm. Um, were you given a reason as to why they weren't going to have you in 2017 and beyond? No, not at all. Wow, not at all. You didn't. You, you didn't. You didn't want to ask. You did like just the fact that they said, you know, we're going to part ways. That's all. You know, I mean, here's here's the real situation and. I'm no different than the guy in merchandise or the 15 vice presidents who got let go or the entire team in Canada that was shut down. I'm not the only guy who was let go by the new ownership. I mean, well over a hundred people, Ariel, and and good friends of both yours and mine. Mm -hmm. I'm the one being talked about because I had the high profile job. But I'm not going to sit here and, and, you know, weep because, you know, new ownership came in and I was one of the guys who got cut. I was one of a lot of people and a lot of good people um, from the Zufa era that got cut. And so I felt for my coworkers, for my friends, as much as I felt for myself. And I, I watched everything around me, you know, be shattered. It's like it, it's like. It took 15 years to build this wonderful family, and it felt like it was taking 15 minutes to destroy it. And it just was a really tough time, and it may still be tough. There may be more to come, you know, throughout the UFC family. Ownership changes, this is not uncommon with an ownership change in in anything. It might be corporate, just corporate America. It might be on Wall Street. In this instance, it's a sports property. So I looked at it from that regard. And also, I mean, let's be realistic. You know, what I do is very subjective. You know, going back to your first question, Ariel, I, I, it's about the fans, but it's ketchup and mustard. You know, I, I could ask 100 people about Bob Costas, 
50 people could say he's the greatest ever. 50 people could say he's the worst of all time. 50 aren't right. 50 aren't wrong. It's just ketchup and mustard. Some people like ketchup. Some people like mustard. So what reason were they going to give me? And would that make me feel any better or any worse? No, not at all. So, you know, honestly, I just felt respect for the other members of the family that also were released. And I'm no better than any of those guys. And so, you know, it, it is what it is. Extremely disappointing, don't get me wrong, but mostly disappointing because our family has really been torn. And, and that's what I'll miss the most. Do you feel like this is a WME IMG decision? In other words, if Lorenzo, Frank were still around owning the company, that this wouldn't have happened? Yes, I do. Okay. I think if uh, Frank and Loren, if this was still Zufa, yeah. um, yes, I don't believe we would be having this conversation. And, of course, the one mainstay from that era is Dana White. What, if anything, did he say to you upon, you know, you finding out about this news, 207, Sacramento? Did you have it? I mean, you've been with him for two decades. There's that famous yeah. story about WWE coming uh, and offering you a deal and you went back and I thought you showed a lot of loyalty, probably could have, you know, gotten a lot more money with WWE. What, if anything, was said between you two when this was, uh, when this was made official? No conversations, uh, no contact, um, nothing, really, nothing. Wow. Um, which was, you know, surprising, disappointing, certainly, uh, but nothing was said. And, uh, you know, I'm going to live with that. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, what matters to me is my family, is my children. Uh, but no, to answer your question directly, there was no conversation, uh, nothing at all. Wow. Wow. Uh, that is surprising to me, just given your position in the company for two decades. Are you surprised by that? Uh, I don't know. You know, I don't know. How do you, how do you answer that really? Right. You know, okay. what's, what's more important to me is my character. You know, I, I'm just going to stay strong, Ariel, and I'm just going to, I'm going to think about myself and the professional that I am and, and my character. And, you know, I don't think there's any way to answer that without it, it, it being somewhat controversial or, or, or somewhat angry. You know what I mean? So, you know, I'll leave that one alone. Okay. Um, but, but certainly I will tell you this, that I'm a team guy and I love the UFC brand and I represented it in the way that I was asked to um, for two decades and of course, you know, about 15 years with Zufa. So yeah, when you carry the flag the way you're asked to, yeah, it was uh, it was somewhat of a bummer <laughs> to say the least. Right. Um, a lot of the fans were disappointed that there was no tribute, that there was no mention on the 207 broadcast that this was your last show. Do you feel the same way? Would you have liked? a chance to say something? Would you have liked some kind of tribute? I, I know it's a weird thing to say, like, oh, I want them to pay tribute to me, but maybe an opportunity <laughs> to say goodbye. Um, I know you kind of, you, 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 if people knew the backstory, maybe they could understand when you were signing off, but if you didn't know the backstory, there's no way you could understand. You were talking about some of your friends in the truck who I know you're very close with. Sure. Would you have liked an opportunity to say something? Was that ever on the table? You know, at the time... Yes, I, I think that would have been pretty cool. Shots of me with the late Jeff Blatnick and, you know, young Goldie back in, you know, 1997 or, you know, watching Bellator the other night and watching Tito walk in reminded me of his walk in right after 9-11 in Vegas, one of the greatest walk ins in mixed martial arts history. Yeah, at the time, I thought it would be pretty cool. I have a chance to thank my partner on the air, uh, one of my best friends. Uh, a guy who I worked with for, like I said, over 200 shows. But now that I've stepped back, Ariel, I I'm kind of glad they didn't because what what turned out to be the tribute was everything that we've talked about, everything that I've read and has been posted all over the world for the past month. And you want to talk about a tribute. That's the most powerful tribute that I could ever ask for. And, and a lot of that came because there wasn't a quote unquote on air tribute. So yeah, maybe at the time I was a bit disappointed, surprised that nothing was officially done. But when I step back and look at it, you know, 
from the big picture point of view, man, the tribute that I'm getting from around the world, from the fans, and not just the fans, from the fans, from fighters, from members of the media like yourself, is awesome. You know, there's been so many. I wish I could thank every single one, you know, one by one by one. But I'll tell you this. Rumble is one of my favorite people in the world. And I was talking to him in Toronto because, of course, it was supposed to be Rumble in D.C. And I got a text from Anthony Rumble Johnson about two or three days after, you know, the whole announcement in my last show. And basically said, he said, I've been trying to track down your number for a couple of days. I hope it's okay that I'm texting you. You've always treated me with so much class and, and you've always been such a good person. I just wanted to let you know that I thank you for everything. And he went on to just, you know, make my heart feel so warm. But it was just, it, it was, this is this mean dude who's as ferocious as anybody saying, I hope it's okay that I text you. That right there. Anthony Rumble Johnson's text, that's a tribute. And he was one of many, but Rumble hunting down my number, Ariel, yeah. for 48 hours to make sure he texts the guy who has always been good to him, that has always, that's always recognized that this man is a beast in the octagon, but he is a heck of a human being outside of it. And I've always been a Rumble fan because of the man he is outside of the octagon. And so it's, it's cases like that that have made me smile over the last few weeks and really will make me smile whenever I think about my UFC run and all the great fighters that I was able to interact with and all the great fights I was able to call. So I recall going back to my hotel room following UFC 207 and uh, there's all kinds of hysteria over Ronda and Cody Garbrandt. And <laughs> one of the, the tweets that's showing up throughout my timeline is from your son, Cole. And then there's another one from your daughter. And then there's another one from your ex-wife. And they're expressing publicly their disappointment in how this whole thing was handled. And, you know, you not getting a chance to say goodbye and, you know, just, just talking about their father. And I know from sometimes we're on the same flight and you're always talking about your son and his hockey team. And you're always talking about your daughter. And I mean, I've seen them at events. I've seen your ex-wife at events. And, and I, I was like, wow, I can't imagine having teenage kids and then going online afterwards and seeing them go to bat for me and speak about me like this. And uh, obviously they can't do much as far as changing things, but just to see them talk about their dad. What was it like when you went online, when you saw that, that your kids were actually, you know, tagging the UFC and UFC executives backing up their old man. What was that like? What do they say when, you know, we come into this earth? Leave a legacy. Plain and simple, right? Leave a legacy. My son, 16 years old, 16 years old. He's a young man. There's no question about it. And he's sitting there at the house, probably at my ex-wife's house, watching the show. I'm sure my ex-wife was in tears. Uh, Kim was with me for a lot of years. She traveled pretty much around the world with me. She was part of the family. She was a big part of the family. Uh, my daughter, Kiera, an actress in New York City. But for Cole to do that, to, to take the initiative, to, to stand up for his father, and he, he's a kid who has watched his father during the times of prep, during the times of pre-production. He has seen all the hard work that goes into this glamorous job in which I have, which is a pretty cool job in which I have. That was tribute enough for the rest of my life, because that's really what it's all about. It's about Kiera and it's about Cole. And Cole was absolutely 100% right in what he, in what he tweeted. Absolutely 100% right. But what warmed my heart was that he took the initiative to do so. And my daughter is a very intelligent young lady as well. And she did the same thing. And I, w I was on the air, Ariel. I didn't sit there and say, hey, Cole, text something or tweet something or go on Facebook. They did it on their own. They understood the big picture. They're my children. They're my legacy. What matters more than that? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Wow. Well, what was that like when you when you left the arena on December 30th? And now, you know, your UFC run is over two decades. I mean, this is a massive part of your life, traveled the world. 
what did you do? How did you, you know, how did you take it all in once you said goodbye finally and put down the headset? I, I'd heard from some people, you and Joe were kind of talking for a little bit. I didn't see this, but some people were saying you guys were kind of sitting cage side. How did you decompress in the minutes and hours afterwards? You know, we, uh, we all sat there, the building was cleared, and we actually all got in the octagon and did pictures. Oh, wow. Joe and I had a couple of big hugs. There were tears. There was uh, confusion, disbelief for sure. Frosty, our longtime audio guy, uh, it was his last show. It was Crew Mark Delagradi's last show. Wow. Um, again, going back to the family, Ariel, and he was emotional. And, you know, being with my stage manager, Niner, Craig Conley, for all those years, we did pictures. We have done pictures in the octagon in, you know, about 100 years. But we did that night, and then we all went back to the dressing room, and Bruce Connell, our longtime producer, and Anthony Giordano, we all just sat there for about an hour, and we just shook our heads. Like, how, how is this happening? How is this ending? Like, you know, back to the shock and disbelief. But we cherished that time together. And, you know, like you said, there were hugs, there were tears. But, you know, there's one thing for sure. And there's one thing that will never be taken away. And that's our friendship. And that's the great run and the memories that we've had together. And, you know, then my fiance Fernanda and I actually went to get a bite to eat with uh, my good friend John Orlando and his father, Tony Orlando, who is a big fan and, uh, you know, knocked three times, Candida, you know, tie a yellow ribbon. And it was interesting. Uncle Tony, as I call him, when I walked up, big Greek, you know, Uncle Tony is unbelievable. And he, and he grabs me and he grabs my face and he goes, Michael, listen to me. You are an unbelievable talent. And the world knows that. This is going to be good for you. Don't you be sad at all because your next opportunity is going to be the best opportunity of your life. And I'm sitting there and uncle Tony won't like Ariel. He won't let me like, <laughs> he's got my cheeks. Like I can't break eye contact. It's, it's against the law right now. And it was just so warming. And, and to have a guy like that, and I've become part of that family over the last couple of years, Tony Orlando, like Tony Orlando, like telling me all is going to be well and, and recognizing that I do have a special gift, much like Tyron Woodley was just talking about. I, you know, I do have a special gift, and that did come from upstairs, and I'm not done using it. It, it was really cool. So we hung out with, you know, Tony and his wife and John and his sister, and we just chilled, and it was a very chill night. Hung out with some of the crew and uh, headed back later. But it, it was kind of cool because Uncle Tony definitely wanted to make sure that, uh, that my spirits were in the right place and that I was more excited about the next opportunity than upset and depressed about what was coming to an end. And then, you know, the next UFC event after 207 is Phoenix. And that's your hometown. <laughs> that's where you live. And I my favorite all-time fighter, my best bud, DJ. The prodigy. And I saw a photo of you two together, so you got a chance to meet up with him, and it's all well and good. And, you know, this was an FS1 show, so it's not, you know, it was it was um, John Anik and Daniel Cormier. You typically have done the pay-per-views and the Fox shows, so, it, you know, it, it, the big change yeah, hadn't quite happened. it wouldn't have been my show. Exactly. That's what, I, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But yeah. middle of the show, and I don't have, uh, you know, great, great vision. Middle of the show, I start to get a flood of tweets saying, Mike Goldberg is in the crowd. Mike Goldberg is like amongst the people doing the, you know, the Hawaiian hang loose sign, whatever it is. That's Mike Goldberg. Like there's no mistaking that that was you. Um, what is the story there? Because for me, maybe you're a bigger man. Like that happens in 20 years and you don't get much of a reason or a goodbye. I don't know if I want to be there two weeks later. You know, maybe there's some hard feelings. Maybe you need a break. Maybe you need some time off and you're sitting there. How did that happen? How did you end up on camera? It's a crazy story. It, it really is a crazy story. And, and it's funny you say that because my father said to me, he said, I wouldn't have been able to do it. He said, I wouldn't have been able to do it. BJ Penn is one of my, my best friends. BJ Penn is one of my favorite people in the world. And I went that night 
for BJ Penn. I also went to that fight that night in my hometown to say thank you. Because going back to what you had asked about 207, everything was, was very laser focused on the direct people that were with me and, and back in the dressing room. I didn't get to say thank you to, you know, the Reed Harris's and, and the Joe Williams and Mike, the photographer and, you know, and, and everybody else in the truck. And because and I, I didn't see them because at 207, I worked and then I finished. So I went to UFC 207 with my friend, Master McGowan, and we, I was in a suite. You mean, so you mean we Phoenix? The concourse. You, you mean yeah, Phoenix? in Phoenix. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. In Phoenix. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. In Phoenix, we went around the concourse, and fans were great. Um, I was thanking them. They were thanking me. We did it again during the main card, and, you know, we're, we're walking around, and I said, I'm going to go down and try to find a seat. I just want to get a little closer to watch BJ. So I just went, this is, this is random. First of all, I'm in a suite uh, with my buddy, and Master McGowan was funny. He said, Ariel, he goes, I never thought there would come a day when I'm helping you get a seat, get a ticket to the UFC. So my master, who's a huge Conor McGregor guy, because the Irish guy, he said, I'm helping you get a seat to a UFC. Huh. But I'm in a suite. I'm not in the stands at all. I decided to get closer for the BJ fight, and Lozon, of course, was the co-main. Yeah. Random row. I go down. I see empty seats. I sit down. These <laughs> dudes in front. I go, anybody sitting here? They're like, no, no, no. Oh, my God. Where are you going? Where are you going? Random seat. Could have been one in 18,000. <laughs> I see the camera come up, and the lights are on. I know it's one of our live cameras. It's one of the, you know, steady cams where they come around and get crowd shots. So I see the light up. I do the shot up. This is what I'm thinking, Ariel. Okay, they spotted me in the, in the crowd, and the truck is saying hello. They're in commercial break, because they're certainly not putting me on TV. That, of course, they're not putting me on TV. They're in commercial break. So sure. I'm like, what's up? Because I think I'm saying hi to, you know, my buddy, the, you know, Anthony Giordano and yeah. Jack and everybody in the truck. I think I'm just saying hi, right? Well, much like your phone and your Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine. Oof. And I'm like, what the... <laughs> so yeah exactly so imagine the production truck now <laughs> go rolls on they go take three or whatever to that crowd shot and out pops goldie hey! <laughs> just think about it for a second it's insane one of eighteen thousand feet one of how many crowd shots <laughs> take camera take doesn't take any camera other than that right and it was just meant to be. I mean, it was unbelievable. The chances of that happening. It wasn't even my ticket. I wasn't even supposed to be in the stands. I was that dude, you know, getting past the usher, grabbing an empty seat to get closer to the action. And then, you know, the fans were great. First off, you know, what a great guy. He's there with the fans, which I was because I am a fan. And I am going to support the prodigy, my buddy BJ Penn. Second... Why isn't he on the floor? <laughs> Third, I hope he didn't have to pay for the ticket. And it just got better and better. Um, and it, it was just awesome. It was just awesome. I just, uh, I, I just shook my head and I just, I should have, right after that, I should have gone and played the lottery. I really should have put some numbers down. Because I was on a roll right then. I really was on a roll. I, I know it's not the spoken word, but in a way, that was your chance to sort of say goodbye with with you know a hand gesture or so, or so to the people on a UFC broadcast. So yeah, that that is an amazing turn of events, and uh, it it was cool to see you. You know, just see that smile. It was it was it was amazing. Um, do you think it's going to be hard to watch fights, or is it ingrained in you? Will you not be able to you know to be a fan? Well, you know, MMA has been my life for the past two decades. And there's a lot of fighters that I'm friends with, that I'm fans of, and that I enjoy watching. And so, first off, no, it, it won't be difficult. It won't be difficult. I might, you know, keep the sound low. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, you know, first off, I'm very good friends with John Anik. I respect the heck out of him. He's a wonderful human being. So, and, you know, there's, there's no, like, there's no hard feelings. There's, there's no, oh, that, that. I'm just, I'm a fan, you know, and, and that's the beauty of it is Joe and I are fans. So, no, I'm going to watch the fights that I'm interested in. 
Um, MMA is part of my life. I'll, I'll probably continue to be in MMA. I sure would like to be. So watching, you know, a certain UFC, it's not going to be like I'm never watching, you know, a UFC again. Now, I might, like, make the neighbor pay for the pay-per-view, you know, and sneak over to his house. You know, I might do that once or twice um, and let them pay for the pay-per-view. Um, I mean, I'll, you know, bring some beer or something, I guess. But, uh-huh. No, I'm kidding. Or maybe I'm not kidding. <laughs> but no, I mean, okay. yeah, it, uh, it, 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 it's, just, it's actually kind of funny. You know, maybe I will make my neighbors for once. <laughs> you, know, it, it, you know, you go back and when, <laughs> when Kim and I were first going our own ways, you know, she used to still, like, order the pay-per-views, and I would kind of laugh, like, because we weren't officially divorced yet. So I was, like, working the pay-per-view and kind of paying for the pay-per-view on the same night. So, you know, this time at least I'll pay for, I'll pay for the pay-per-view but not work it. No, I mean, I, I'm not that guy. And you know me well enough, Ariel. I'm not that guy. I'm going to watch the fights I want to watch. Um, and they're not just going to be UFC fights. I watched Tito and Chael. Of course I did. Mm-hmm. You know what was cool about that? Is they had a graphic of notable wins before the fight began. Yeah. And I'm looking at Tito's graphic of notable wins, and I'm going, call that, call that, call that, huh. call that, call that, call that, call that. Wow. It was pretty cool. Yeah. It was pretty cool. And you know what I liked at the end, too? Because every time Tito would fight with this people's champion thing, I'm like, no, he's not. He's like the Huntington Beach bad boy. At the very end, the, the ring announcer said, you know, the former Huntington Beach bad boy. And I loved it because he's the Huntington Beach bad boy. Yes. So, of course, I'm going to watch. I'm going to watch fights. I'm going to watch one championship. I'm going to watch Bellator and I'm going to watch the ultimate fighting championship. Um, OK, so people want to know what is next. Are you going to be showing up on our TV screens, you know, in the next few weeks? Do you have anything? Are you taking some time off? What can you tell us about what's next for you? Well, I'm the kind of person who doesn't sit still for more than 30 to 40 seconds. <laughs> so, you know, the minute that I got the news, you know, I'm already thinking about, you know, what's next? What's the next adventure? What's the next journey? And, you know, where, where am I going to go next? What am I going to do next? Is it going to be an MMA? Is it going to be a return to hockey? Is it going to be in Vegas, you know, as the announcer for the new hockey team. Can oh, wow. I get on with an existing team? You know, what's next? And there's some great opportunities out there, and I've had some great conversations. And you, you, the thing that I'm most excited about is to continue to do what I love, and that's to entertain, to be enthusiastic, to be energetic, and to be with people that some I've worked with before, some will be a new journey. The best part of my time with the UFC was not Madison Square Garden, was not UFC 200. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Those were magnificent, absolutely magnificent. And when Michael Bisping defended his belt at home, that was sick. I mean, that was awesome. But you know what was better? The first time we went to England and when we went to Abu Dhabi and the first time I went to Sweden and Belfast, in the first time we went to Dublin, and the first time we went to Atlantic City in the Trump Plaza, and the last time we went to Big St. Louis, Mississippi, thank goodness, and the last time we went to, oh man, what were some other places which I'm glad we didn't go anymore? There were a lot of other ones too. <laughs> um, you know, but my point is, is that the, the coolest part about my time with the UFC was when the journey was really a journey. When we were, were catching fire, when, when we were really starting to get some momentum and we were making all these major jumps and changes and first show ever in Las Vegas. Like I've told this story before, Ariel, when we first had dinner with Frank and Lorenzo and Dana, when they had bought the company, you know, they spoke and were at this Italian restaurant in Vegas and it's like, any questions? And, and I'll always remember it. I, I asked Lorenzo, because I wasn't a Vegas guy, and so he landed, you see all the billboards and all that. And I asked Lorenzo Fertitta, would the UFC ever be on a billboard in Vegas? 
That was it. That was my expectation. That was my highest hope. And he said, yes, yes, it will. And I, we were on a few billboards <laughs> and, and still we're on a few billboards. But, but that was the best. Sky Dome, 55,000 people. Those are the shows that really when I look back, now that I'm able to look back, those were the ones that were the coolest. Because the first is always going to be the first. And there were a lot of firsts during my run from 1997 to UFC 207 in 2016. And who knows, maybe in some of these other places, some of these other stops, I'll be able to catch that journey on the upswing and experience some of those, you know, some of those moments that I just described to you on my UFC run, some of those moments on another run with somebody down the road, because those were very, very special times. So fair to say right now you're, you're not able to tell us what exactly is next. That would be correct. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you're, you're still open to remaining in the sport in some capacity. Um, as you, I, I know, I mean, you, you mentioned the Las Vegas thing, the hockey thing. Wow. What a perfect connection that is. Um, you know, you've called so many great sporting events in Vegas and, and with your background in hockey, your love for hockey, your passion. I remember one time I was working for Fox sports, um, and I was doing, I don't know, some report backstage and I just, Subtle, and it really had no reason to be in there, but I subtly mentioned the Columbus Blue Jackets only for you. And I knew that you would pick up on it and you picked up on it right away just because I knew you would appreciate a hockey reference in the middle of an MMA broadcast. So that's a phenomenal idea. Um, but but all to say you are interested if the deal is right, if the opportunity is right and still remaining in MMA possibly, correct? Absolutely. One hundred percent. OK. Um, by the way, for sure. just out of curiosity, did you ever did you hear from Lorenzo or Frank Fertitta? You know, I, I did send a thank you Lorenzo's way, but it was previous to, you know, my last show at UFC 207. Okay. And I know he got the message because I made sure with his office. Um, you know, one of the most rewarding things for me, and you're going back to Cole now, is Lorenzo sponsored my son's hockey team. Wow. Um, it was four or five straight years, and it was a generous sponsorship. And forget about everything else. When he did that year after year for our hockey team, that was something you do within a family. And I'll never forget that. Because to me, that always meant more to me than the professional part. Of course, I respect Frank and Lorenzo Fertitta. Like, I respect none other. There's people I respect as much. But, man, I respect the heck out of them, especially Lorenzo, because I dealt with them for so long and, and I dealt with him in the good and the bad and the indifferent. And I have so much respect for Lorenzo Fertitta and the way he treats people. And certainly I have so, so much gratitude for what he has provided for me and my family. But, but the sponsorship of the hockey team, that was just always different for me. And I felt like he was saying, Goldie, of course I will. You're part of the family. And so, yeah, that, that was very special when Lorenzo did that year after year. And we have UFC patches on our jerseys. Wow. And I always say it makes our kids think they're a little tougher. <laughs> I don't know if it does for real, but it makes them feel a little tougher when they get on the ice. Phenomenal stuff, Mike, really. Um, you know, I, I heard uh, a segment on a radio show in Phoenix, I believe it was, and the name and station, the name of the show and the station are escaping me and, and correct me if you recall them, someone talking about you and paying tribute to you and, and mentioning that he wanted to interview you about your departure and that you told him that you were going to talk to us first and come on this show first. And that meant the world to me. So I can't thank you enough. And it was just amazing to see how many people were excited that they were going to finally hear from you. And even now the messages while you're speaking of, of people supporting you. So uh, I think you should be very proud and, and happy of the legacy and the impact that you've had, uh, not only on the sport, but the fans as well. You, you, you know, you were the soundtrack to the UFC for 20 years and no one could take that away from you. So kudos to you. And please do keep us posted on your next step. I have a feeling given how passionate and loyal these fans are, they are going to follow you, even if it's outside MMA. Well, they've been very kind and, you know, they've been, they've been very kind and, you know, I'm enjoying some of the tweets as, you know, the last few weeks have gone on, you know, as my buddy Greece, I, I did a segment on his weekly show, cage side seat 
MMA, it's, it's here in Phoenix, and I like what he said, and I sent it to you. We can share that with everybody, Ariel, that, you know, it, it was funny the way he said it. He said, I talked to Goldie. Everything that we talked about is off the record. He said when he talks, he's going to talk to Ariel Hawani. I don't like that because I'm competitive, but I respect it. Ariel's his guy. He was there before I started this. It was cool what he did, and I know that it meant a lot to you. At the end of the day, it's about people. Um, it's about relationships. It's about a legacy, like I said. When I was sick, and there were rumors going all over the world, there was one man who wanted to get the story right, who wanted to talk to my doctors, who wanted to know the truth, and who also challenged me with some tough questions when we did an interview. And that was you. And I'll never forget that. I will never, ever forget that. You waited until it was time. When I was sick, when I missed the show, when I missed the second fight with Kanan Jr., and I know my doctors got with you directly. Ariel Hawani, you're great at your job, but you're also loyal. And you also have a ton of character, brother. That's why I'm here with you first. And that will never change. My respect for you will never change. And that's because not only did you do the interview, but you took the time to step back and try to find out the truth. When a lot of the world a few years back was more happy to go with the rumors and throw me under the bus without any validity to any of the rumors, not Ariel Hawani. Ariel Hawani wanted to know the truth. And I respect you for that. And I love you for that forever. And I thank you for the opportunity to do the interview today. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that very much. Uh, sorry, sorry it went down this way, but we'll be hearing from you soon. And, and please do keep us posted on what's next. I wish you nothing but the best. Thanks, my brother. All right. We'll talk to you soon. There he is, Mike Goldberg. Great stuff from him. So happy that he did come on and that we were able to hear from him and hear his side of the story. And very curious to see where he lands. I'm sure we will be finding out soon.